Social media famous comedian Matt Reif made his Netflix debut last month with the hour-long stand-up special Natural Selection, which ended up being the streaming platform's second most viewed television program of the week with 7.4 million views. Although after just one quick glance at Matt and his greasy slimeball face and his smug Botox frozen expressions, it becomes clear that not everybody was tuning in because they just love terrible comedy. Sure, Matt came to Netflix with a sizable baked in audience, what with over 18 million TikTok followers, the majority of whom were young women who got drawn in by the video clips he posted of his quick-witted, charming interactions with audience members at his live gigs. Soon, Matt became known as a crowd work comedian, as well as a bit of a heartthrob, what with his all-American look and all Eastern European ancestry. I mean, I think I get it. He looks like a type of white fish that's been packed in salt before they cut the face off of it. Mmm, now that'll sure keep you alive on a round-the-world ship voyage from Scandinavia. But alas, when looking for something to watch on Netflix, natural selection is not the most natural selection, and a lot of its viral success could arguably be attributed to the near-instant backlash and outrage that uh, Matt sparked with his controversial yet vaguely familiar jokes, culturally appropriative manner of speaking, and a seemingly dismissive and disrespectful attitude towards women. Yes, as in the only people who support him online and helped him sell out a world tour and filled an entire stadium for the taping of this special, where many couldn't help but notice a slight refresh to Matt's face, thanks presumably to an injectable cosmetic specialist who took one look at Matt and said, he would look even hotter as a jack-o'-lantern. So today, we're diving into this critically panned piece of work and discussing Matt Reif's equally terrible responses to the negative feedback. Witness the cracks forming in Matt's porcelain complexion as he accidentally reveals that his brand of being the cool guy who doesn't care what anyone thinks and hates how sensitive audiences have become was all just a mask to disguise a privileged youngster who actually cares what everyone thinks, even if you're literally in kindergarten, and who feels like he's allowed to make jokes about anything and anyone, but then throws a fit when anyone decides to roast him back, like the shiny, buttered up little pig that he looks like. So everyone drive safely and be sure to tip your server. And get ready for Matt Reif to come out here and try to tickle your funny bone by violently bashing it with a crowbar. In today's awesome jokes that you just don't understand installment of Clip Breakdown. Mwah. television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web, and we break it down like a set list full of comedians that you never wanted to see, but are always going to live in your house, so that we can break down each individual setup and punchline and determine if they were politically correct or if we're just a bunch of snowflakes who hate everyone, like racists and homophobes and misogynists, like get over it. No, for real. This material is straight up not funny. I get it. Controversial jokes have a place if they're funny, if they're original, if they make your eyes open to like the problem at large and you can understand from the actual construction of the joke itself that the intent is good. That's not what we have here. I'm not going to get into it before I let you know that you should give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see clip breakdowns on even more Netflix comedy specials like this. Amy Schumer, I'm coming for your leather pants, your leather pants ass. <laughs> but most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right below this video. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload them like all the time. <laughs> That's legally the best claim I can make at this point in time. But I also have like a Patreon and a merch store. Patreon members, please take note that now I can make a specific chat room for every video. And so I'm going to be jumping on to Patreon for an hour noon, the day after this video comes out. That's noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so that we can talk about the video, get ideas for the next one, and have other exclusive chat opportunities. So join Patreon if you're interested in chatting with me tomorrow. Here's the thing. As I mentioned, Matt Reif, and I still gotta make sure that that's his real name. I'm like convinced his name is Mike Rat. <laughs> 
up. Mike Rat. Oh God. It's Matt Rife. Yeah. Rife with controversy. It's like the Nicki Minaj of people who suck. He got famous from having, I mean, he was on Wild and Out, which is a, I guess like improvisational slash reaction show, sort of like Whose Line Is It Anyway, but for BET. It's also on VH1. He replaced Pete Davidson in that cast as the one white person on the cast. You might say token white person, but it doesn't really feel fair in the world of television to make white people tokens. That's not really a thing. Although he would tell you differently because poor Matt, he had a really hard upbringing. He grew up in Maryland or something. This guy, he reeks of white privilege and that weird bravado that people have at age 28 when they have like 300 or more followers on TikTok. So anyway, he got really famous after Wild and Out on TikTok because he would do live shows and he was really well known for improvising and sparring with the crowd or like making these memorable comic jokes that came up from just asking questions to audience members. And also in these TikTok videos where he's like 23 through 20, whatever, I'm just gonna say it, he looks a lot less creepy than he does during this special. It's a little bit Jim Carrey in the mask here, but on his early days, he's experimented with different hair colors, blonde, for instance. He has a straight teeth type of personality, so I can see why people on the internet would like be drawn to this. He's funny-ish enough and charming-ish enough to the people in his audience at the time, you know, giving attention to the moms and the elderly ladies in the audience. He's very much like schmoozing to impress your parents type of person, which I just f hate. But obviously that drew in a large fan base of women or people who identify as women and are attracted to people who present as men, you know, whatever. You get the non-binary lingo of it all. The point is, that's not good enough for Matt. And he's been making a conscious effort. It seems like starting with this Netflix special to pivot towards a more male audience. It feels like he's trying to go for like a Joe Rogan experience type of experience where the dudes like him. He can hang with the bros. He says the word dog a lot. It's like the way that he speaks in this comedy special is so culturally inappropriate. <laughs> like he's using the dialect that black Americans often use called African-American vernacular English, which is something that white people in movies or comedians often lean on as a crutch to make whatever they're saying when it's not funny on its own sound wacky and interesting. But that's not fair and it's actually harmful to black communities because those people are negatively judged for the way that they speak in almost every scenario of their lives. And they don't have the choice to put it on and take it off like a coat, like an ugly black button up coat that you're wearing in this stupid fucking thing. But besides from that, which I feel like no, not enough people are talking about that part, but everyone's mostly mad because you don't even have to watch this special for five minutes before he completely abandons the trust of the women who have been fans of him for the last few years and have been loyally following him and waiting for this special who are sitting in the audience and is not even for a joke that you haven't heard before. Let's watch. Just for context, this special was taped in Baltimore and Matt opens the show by making a joke about how Baltimore is such a wacky state from location to location, basically saying, you're trash. The hostess had a black eye. My boy who I was with was like, man, I feel like they should put her in the kitchen or something. I was like, yeah, but I feel like if she could cook, she wouldn't have that black eye. Mm, okay, you can't tell an original or funny joke, but you still have a Netflix comedy special. So there's something a little suspicious about your logic, but maybe that's on purpose so it matches your cheek filler. At any rate, that joke was tired and derivative, and that makes it even harder to excuse its problematic and potentially triggering subject matter. I think that laughter and joking about serious issues can be healing, and the people who suffer great pain or injustices or trauma can like get some sort of benefit out of jokes that make light of that topic, but they have to be funny. They have to be funny to work, no? And even then it's a gamble. Like some people just are never going to appreciate that word or that topic being brought up in their lives because they actually experienced it and they live with it every day. So what makes Matt here think he has the right to joke about domestic violence? Just because he's been punched in the face by men several time. I don't condone physically harming anyone, but those guys at a bar might have just been defending themselves from what they thought was the invasion of the body snatchers. Because that plasticine appearance and uncomfortable appropriation of slang drops him directly into the uncanny valley. But hey, I think in that valley, they don't even get the internet. So he might be able to sell some tickets to one more show at the uncanny comedy club there. Once all of this 
hits the fan. Obviously, this joke did not go over well with a lot of the audience, and Matt would have you believe that's because we all just have a horrible sense of humor. It's like, buddy, if we didn't laugh, then you have the horrible sense of humor. Like, if the majority of people don't think it's funny and just think it's stupid to say and rude, then it's like the majority shareholders rule, right? Like, you're the one with the bad sense of humor. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you know how to do it? But no, he's trying to just start off controversially right off the bat to win over the dude bros. Come on, just guys being dudes, bro. <laughs> just testing the water, seeing if y'all are gonna be fun or not. I figured we start the show with domestic violence, it be pretty smooth sailing after that. I mean, I'd at least hope that if this were the start, there'd be nowhere else to go but up. But that's not exactly the same as smooth sailing. Unless, are you referring to how you're only going to get booked on Carnival Cruise Lines after this special airs? Well, bon voyage. Don't forget to remain at sea forever. From the get-go, Matt faced strong social media backlash over this joke in particular. It's so stupid to put your most controversial joke at the top of the show. Look, like looking at my own YouTube videos, a lot of people don't even make it through 60% of this video. But like a 90% make it through the first minute or so. So by putting your joke first that's like the most controversial, it seems like a very deliberate attempt to weed out, as he said, the more sensitive audience members, but that's not smart in comedy. Like literally they talk about it in stand up. You gotta win over the audience. Like a lot of us watching Netflix have never seen him before. We don't know him from TikTok and he looks kind of unlikable. Like someone who would wear those weird square tipped shoes to dinner, the shiny black ones. Anyway, he's gotta win us over, warm us up a little bit by endearing us to yourself, be self-deprecating, point out that you look like the hyena from Lion King. I don't know. Don't start by instantly alienating half of the population of the world, especially when that half is 90% of the people who are even the reason you have money to begin with. Because I don't know, young people don't know when hot is hot or ugly is ugly. It would seem. Matt tried to apologize for this, quote unquote, by not apologizing, posted an Instagram story that says, if you've ever been offended by a joke I've told, here's a link to my official apology. And then the link says, tap to solve your issue, which already I'm like, if that's not great wording, even as a setup to the punchline that he's trying to tell here, if you tap the link, it takes you over to a medical supply shop that sells special needs helmets. Real mature and super nice to the special needs people of the world and those who care for them and love them and have to work every day to protect them from stigma and injustice and cruelty. Although Matt would tell you that this is not making fun of special needs people. It's literally making making fun of people who have special needs that need to be taken care of when they go to a comedy show. It's like, that's literally the same thing. You're making fun of both people at once. You're drawing attention to the fact that maybe some special needs people have to wear certain types of equipment to stay safe, while also making fun of the fact that people who don't need that equipment do need it because it signifies that they are in some way special. It's so stupid that you can't even see that connection. Like, come on, you dumb so Matt has been on a PR journey to like kind of renovate, I guess, his public image after a lot of people are like, we don't like this. Not just the women in the audience. Obviously, even men are offended by this joke. You don't have to be a woman to think that domestic violence is not funny because many men do not commit domestic violence, do not believe in hurting women. Novel idea. But some of the interviews that Matt has done make it seem like he literally thinks that all men think that he's funny and some of them are just like not admitting it because they're virtue signaling. Especially when he goes on this interview on the podcast for Jordan Peterson, a, I think, very Canadian sounding controversial right wing political commentator. I don't know what you're talking about. And I don't know what either of you are wearing. It's like a gay couple going to prom from different sides of the track. It's a modern twist on an old joke. You know what I mean? It, yeah. was, it was a real circumstance that happened. Oh, I'm sorry. A, a, an exaggerated... Yeah instance that really happened and I went, you know, this is this is a classic joke. Why not give my own personal modern twist on it and move on? You're right. It was exactly the same old sh joke we've all heard before. But what exactly was your modern twist? Because you told that same old joke, but like not in middle school. I don't think it counts. Between Matt and the podcast host Jordan, it feels like a competition between two dip with highly exposed socks to see who can sound the most pretentious. Here's a highlight reel of two guys talking out of their ass. The Harridan women who were screeching like fishwives. It's a very, very small town. I had to drive past it for tour. 
nothing had changed. And I thought that was beautiful. Orangutans tend to hang around in trees and they have these big fat pads around their face that are circular. I saw kids riding their bikes and running around playing outside when I was driving through town. I go, I haven't seen that in years. They get so large they can't really go in trees anymore. Mm -hmm. People weren't on their phones. And the females come to them. But then there are other males in the vicinity. Their strategy is sneaky. Even people at the gas station when we stopped in, the, the workers in there were talking, hanging out. Nobody was just on their phone scrolling. High school shooters will shoot up a high school for attention and they'll shoot themselves afterwards, which seems to be run kind of contrary to their desire for attention. Mm -hmm. But what that just shows is how much people want attention. So it's almost like their own insecurity and lack of manhood probably isn't the best word to use, but it, it stunts their own evolution. Well, it's it, it, it. It, 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 today, Junior! Wow, listen to this intelligent back and forth between two superior thinkers. Hey, did each of you bring your favorite nonfiction books to shove up each other's asses during the lunch break? That way, it's like you're sharing each other's very special knowledge and absorbing each other's specialness. Okay, but for now, back to the topic at hand. Why don't you both share some more Animal Planet factoids while greasing up each other's let me pause for a second. I don't want to get too swept up talking about this until I talk about Colon Broom, the sponsor of today's video. As I've said in a previous partnership, Colon Broom is a high quality dietary supplement and it is high fiber to support your gut and microbiome health. The main ingredient is psyllium husk, which is scientifically proven to benefit intestinal problems and have a positive impact on things like diarrhea, constipation, even blood pressure and weight loss. Psyllium husk powder is a bold bulk forming soluble that helps soften your stool so that it's easier to use the bathroom. When you can gently flush out waste from your body, you're going to feel lighter and generally more comfortable, especially if you suffer from bloating or occasional irregularity. I also love colon broom because it increases my feeling of satisfaction after eating. This can be helpful if you're trying to maintain a healthy body weight, but ultimately what I love doing is nourishing the good healthy bacteria in my gut. The gut is like your second brain. It controls a whole lot of stuff in our body. So combining colon broom with a healthy gut helps control your hunger levels and improve digestion. Colon Broom is a prebiotic fiber supplement and it's 95% psyllium husk. That means it's doing a lot of work for you in the background with just one tasty drink. It's sweetened with the natural plant-based stevia. That means there is no sugar in here and it's blended in the USA with thousands of satisfied customers. The body really needs fiber in order to remain healthy. For example, due to the high fiber content, Colon Broom may help with cardiovascular health when paired with other dietary interventions and physical activities that we know keep us healthy. The same goes for managing blood glucose levels in the body. And beyond supporting long-term health, Colon Broom is just here to help make sure that you have a pleasant bathroom experience, which mama, I'm not gonna lie, it's an important thing, especially coming up on the holidays. Join Colon Broom's biggest sale of the year and get six months worth of Colon Broom for 65% off. You don't wanna miss out on this limited time offer and use code Duramio10 and get an extra 10% off your whole order. Click the link in the description below and get get your discounted batch of Colon Broom while there is still some left in stock. And thank you so much to Colon Broom for sponsoring today's video. Matt Reif is here trying to prove that his unfunny first joke was actually a strong start because comedy is like taking things that people don't want to talk about and talking about them anyway. That's literally the point. It's like, no, it's not. No, it's not. At its root core, it is not. That can be used to, as a means of creating the subversion of expectations that comedy really stems from. But again, it, it depends highly on your audience and your ability to speak with like an exacting vocabulary. Even his link CTA was like, click here to solve your issues. Like, I don't know what that means. Even a special needs helmet doesn't solve every issue that a special needs person would have. Obviously that's true. So like the, the comparison is not apples to apples. Do you understand? Like we need to be very specific when we make jokes because the words matter. My brain subconsciously knows like I'm trying to work out the math and like doing some conversions between different interpretations of English words before I can even start to enjoy the clever approach he has to life, which he does not have one, I'm just saying. Even intelligent people need the joke wording to be obvious because you don't want people thinking their way through your joke or you having to explain it. If they have to explain it to themselves, that's the same problem. But anyway, yeah, Matt's really sure that that was a great first joke and it's a hill that he's willing to die on, but it's even better watching Jordan over here hike up on that same hill carrying twin coffins on his back, trying to convince us that not only was Matt's joke hilarious, but it was also brave and layered with intelligence. And Matt Reif is one of the most talented 
ever to sit in a huge sweatshirt acting pious. Listen to how he tries to <laughs> intellectualize that joke. But partly because in recounting it and sharing it, you also signaled that it can be talked about, it can be faced, and it can be transcended and yeah. got by it. We can make yeah. light of it. And that's what great comedians do continually. And so I thought that's what you did with the domestic violence joke. Comedy is all about making the audience listen or even sit in a chair directly facing all of the subjects and make them uncomfortable. And then the comedian forces you to kiss that subject and make out with it in front of him. Now that topic that was too taboo has its tongue inside of your mouth and it's going to second base. And that's how we encourage dialogue and levity. And that, Matt, is exactly what I, uh, I think you did with your, with your story about how you clogged all your shower drains with semen at your house. Like, come on, Jordan, the more you try to take Matt's defense seriously, the more stupid you sound. And he's full of this kind of f word salad. I mean, school shooters, they shoot up their schools for attention and then they shoot themselves, which is not something that one would do for attention, but that just shows how much people in this country want attention. Like, is everyone in this country a school shooter? Did your sentence even make sense to you? You just want to say the most a shocking thing that you possibly can while still sounding like someone who's wearing a tie. Oh, it's so annoying. Anyway, enough of that podcast for now. I'm just gonna leave this all in the past and look forward to the future and, oh, there's so much to look forward to in the new year. Like, new school boards for many people. Did you know that in 2023, over 9,000 public school districts have had or are having their regular school board elections? That's over 69% of all of the public schools in the USA. Does that sound boring? Well, does this sound and not boring? This is the year where we've had book bans widespread across the country. We've had politically motivated changes to curriculum about gender and sexuality. Disgusting. The school board elections help decide who's driving those conversations. If you can vote, then you can vote in school board elections. So get aware, make sure you know when your school board elections are. You can find out at uh, ballotpedia.org slash school underscore board underscore elections comma underscore 2023. Although somehow that URL doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. So you can also visit the shortened version that I made nickd.tv slash school 23 so that you can find out when your school board elections are. And next time you'll be able to help decide whether a book about trans kids be being allowed to live is allowed in school. I think it should be. Matt goes on to make long-winded stories about how cool he was with the person in his class who had Down syndrome. He's really trying to like, through the, the context of the stories, sound like he was the cool guy who's cool with everyone, but he that's why he can make the jokes about people with special needs, because he knew someone with special needs once who didn't think he was an ass f Like, okay. And he's, he's also always trying to pander to people older than him. He's like, anyone my age or younger? I don't know, I can't relate to you because I'm just so smart and so smart. And he's like trying to talk up his knowledge of cool indie bands. I hate young people. I got a tattoo of, of John Lennon on the back of my arm. It's obviously John Lennon. Like it's, it's a good tattoo. On Instagram, everybody was like, he's a Harry Potter fan. Okay, I could see that happening, photorealistic Squidward. So I'm not here to dispute your story, except for the part about that being a good tattoo. Do you have any body art other than that nickel-sized disembodied head of John Lennon floating on the milky abyss of your arm flab? Hmm, I don't know, he must have a low pain tolerance. Otherwise, he probably would have gone for something bigger that has a similar significance, like a tribal armband, or perhaps just a string of Japanese characters that read, I crave the approval of other heterosexual men. That's why you got a postage stamp of John Lennon on your, the back of your arm and thought that that would make my dad be your friend? Please. My dad wouldn't even give you one of those men-to-men -men nods of acknowledgement if he was standing in line behind you at Subway. Anyway, the John Lennon reverence goes on for some time. That is so disrespectful to one of the greatest musicians of all time. Same glasses, but he's the boy who didn't live. <laughs> I know. And if that made you sad, you're my audience. Good, I like you a lot. Mm, no, I think they're your audience because they had to accompany their teenage daughters to see the most unfunny facial filler boy of all of the comedy side of TikTok. Like you're not even almost funny, Mike Rufy. In fact, I actually feel bad for you because you like stole your entire personality from the wisecracking dad of your best friend in elementary school. Mm, and he still didn't ask you to be his son after you ate dinner there one night. Oh, you're heartbroken to that extent about John Lennon's death that happened over a decade before you were born. He's 28. Or do you just feel the need to endear yourself to Gen X adults because none of them are familiar with the 2010 
and Tumblr memes that you've based most of these jokes off of. I can't stand comedy that's just based on like ubiquitous meme talk, like things we've all heard or read from some tweet that was based on some post on some video on the internet made by people who are not professional comedians. That's no place to source your material. Think of something smart that hasn't been posted before. It's not that hard if you're trying, if you can, baby boy, with your high cheekbones up to the sky. I hope you die, I hope you die. I'm sorry, I don't hope he dies. That was, I'm not a freestyle rapist. <laughs> rapist, ah! Not the subtitles having to say rapist now. Oh my God. There are so many jokes in this just don't make sense. Like we get it. You think you're cool because you were friends with an elderly person as a child. And he told you stories about being in the war and that somehow makes you the coolest person. Like we get it. You're friends with the special needs people. You're friends with the gay kids who hate you. You're friends with the old people who've been with civil rights activists. Like you better shut the f up. This guy was the coolest person I had ever met. <laughs> he told me he fucked Rosa Parks in the front of the bus. <laughs> and I was like, I don't think that happened the way you remembered it. I don't think the Rosa Parks thing happened the way you remember it. What is the, like Rosa Parks is known for sitting at the front of the bus. Not why would, like in the joke world, why would it be anywhere else? Do you know what you're talking about? Or do you just use phrases and buzzwords like as though you're skimming through that chapter in a history book? It doesn't make you intelligent. It doesn't make you intelligent. And that face you made, it doesn't make you pretty, but he's full of weird facial expressions make him seem a little undignified. He really doesn't want women to be his fans anymore. He is making himself into the biggest asshole. I'm also terrified to have kids, man, because I've made fun of a lot of people. You believe in karma. My kid is about to have five legs and a shark fin on his back. And when he's finally like, why am I like this? I'm just there like, ooh, cause daddy's funny. Ew, was he just Getting out that joke like a dog who ate plastic bags? Excuse me, sir, it seems like you're trying to channel Aziz Ansari with that vocal inflection, but you're actually channeling, ah, oh, geez, I'm sorry, with your stomach infection. That was a Dr. Seuss type of rhyme. You're welcome. However, I'm not gonna, once again, argue with the first part of Rifey Maddie's statement. In fact, I think we can all get behind the statistical probability of him having a really ugly shark baby that has too many limbs, but there's no way it would be because of the karma from his really cool attempts at insult comedy, but rather due to him injecting his ass cheeks full of shark collagen, which then cause all of his weird feral sperm cells to get in a fight with one another and then fuse together within his dehydrated hot Cheeto horse glue semen. I honestly don't think there's anything that makes people seem less funny that takes me out of a comedy act more than uh, when someone seems overconfident and they're own sense of humor. Your daddy's so funny. Like, mm, I wouldn't go even nearly that far. And yeah, we know you think you're funny. That's why you keep cracking up at your own jokes with that f ass Woody Woodpecker laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you sound like right now. Oh, during the thing about this person with special needs that he was friends with in high school, he apparently had, was well endowed, this man. So he's trying to make the joke that like, if God hands you a disadvantage, he also hands you an advantage as well. And then he like tries to get sympathy from the audience being like, do you think I'm pretty? It's like, no, we don't. We think you look like a GI Joe that's been in the microwave. Short bus, but a long man. That's what life's all about at the end of the day. Balance, you can't have everything. Sometimes you're just funny. Sometimes maybe, but not on this night, the night of your Netflix comedy taping, that much we know. Sometimes you just joke in ways that aren't easy to understand. Sometimes you speak in African-American vernacular English as though that makes anything you say a punchline. Sometimes you look out at the audience with the face of a Pixar fish. Why does he only use the dialect that's natively spoken by black Americans when he gets on stage to perform his comedy for a mostly young white audience? Explain that to me, you animated sea creature. This is what's known as the black scent, which is speaking in a way that mimics or mocks AAVE from a person who is not black. That's the definition given by Nisenga K. Burton, co-director of the film and media management concentration at Emory University, who has studied depictions of race in Hollywood. And as I mentioned before, it's not cool to speak with a black scent ever. Black scent being defined as someone who's not black using that way of speaking. Quote, non-black celebrities are celebrated in entertainment for appropriating African-American culture, especially our vernacular, while African-Americans are either demonized or overlooked when speaking in black vernacular, she says. Other activists point out that it's a way of speaking that can be abandoned when it's convenient. Quote, 
It's not just that people cosplay blackness, it's that they flip their performance off like a switch the instant they need to distance themselves from blackness. That's from artist Bree Newsom, who tweeted that. Quote, they don't have that black scent around the cops and they also don't show up for racial justice issues. It's minstrelsy. And Matt Reif is a perfect example. As soon as he's put in a position where he wants apparently to seem professional, serious, or thoughtful, almost like he perceives people who actually speak AAVE as incapable of having those qualities. There may be subtlety to it for people like me who like live with white privilege and that's why it's important to read from people who have the experience of being black to understand like it seems subtle because it's like code switching but when you don't have the option of just changing the way that you speak he's making the problem worse. Let's go back to the Jordan Peterson podcast. I don't care how many times these two kiss each other gently on the forehead and say good job. At the end of the day it's just two people ego stroking each other who are on the same side of the same issues which is pointless because it's clear neither of them are familiar with one another's work. I'll be truthfully honest, I've, I've never, I haven't done extensive research into everything you've done, but I find you to be a very kind man. So you do prepared material as well? Yeah, I have two full specials on YouTube right. that are okay, fully so material. I've only seen the crowd work. Matt just said, I don't know who you are or what you do, but you are on my side and you agree with me and therefore you can be my grandpa. Meanwhile, Jordan is like, and I didn't see your Netflix special, but I'm just positive you made groundbreaking and hilarious comments and everyone on the planet is just stupid for not seeing your noble intentions. Next time, you can pick out some even more ill-fitting jeans that make your legs seem unnaturally long. Look how freakishly daddy long legs Matt's feet look right now. It's like, are you wearing clown clothes and stilts? Okay. Some more stupid comparisons from Matt that just shows the inaccuracy of his comedy. Like, you gotta be exacting with your words in this art form. And he's always talking about comedy as an art form. It's like, bitch, your finger painting. She was so religious, but just not a good person. Like what kind of Christian wakes up to read the Bible every morning when last night all you wanted me to do was lick your butt? <laughs> like what? Um, I'll tell you what kind of Christian does that. Christian Montgomery, the muscular go-go dancer who's studying theology and also volunteers behind the front desk of the place where I get free STD tests. <sighs> I know that was a rhetorical question. I just really wanted to tell you about my new boyfriend, Christian Montgomery, who I just made up. Here's a more important question. What kind of comedian is so puritanical and bland that he doesn't even like to eat ass. He said he tried it once and I feel even more sorry for the girl whose ass cheeks had to accommodate that Mount Rushmore sized jawline that you had installed for this comedy special. And also, how does a woman who desires anal lingus indicate that she's not a good person? It's such an illogical pair of things to connect for this joke. Not just that it's not right to say that people who are sexual in some way are not capable of being religious or getting into heaven. That's obviously by like nature, not true and problematic, I believe. But just from looking at it like a comedian, you need to make the comparison something that more people would understand to be a bad thing. Many people perform that sex act that you said makes them a bad person. So it's like already, I can't relate to the joke. Me specifically, who <laughs> rough. Make it something that more people would understand to be a bad thing. Like she's the type of girl that will lead the Bible study group, but then bury my antidepressants in the backyard because she thinks I better when my anger is unresolved. But no, we get the joke that we got. He goes into a long spiel about ghosts and monsters, about how he believes in ghosts and monsters. Like, I think he's trying to do this like Nick Swarzen type of, suddenly I'm just like a boyish young boy who believes in monsters. And he tells us about all the monsters he believes in. It's like, this is so, such fucking bullshit. The fact that he sat in that podcast and was like, this was a real experience that happened to me. It's like, then he had to walk back and be like, okay, it never actually happened, but I thought about it and we riffed on it. It's like, just go home. Can't have a monster coming out of the closet. That's scary twice. You telling me not only is there a monster in my room, but maybe he's gay. <laughs> I mean, it was clear that you're frightened by gay people based on the work of the hairdresser and wardrobe stylist that prepared you for tonight's show. Those crispy strands and that low quality fabric were clearly the decisions made by straight guys with neck tattoos that you met on Melrose and you desperately wanted to think you were cool. Like you should be afraid of gay people. Our Botox looks so much better than that that we will find the person who did this to you and write a negative Yelp review on your behalf. We're trying to be nice, but we're gonna mention you by name. So say goodbye to that celebrity discount. This face, by the way, people 
People are obviously making jokes about his very high cheekbones when he came out on stage for this special. And hopping on that trend, some random cosmetic surgeon type of person, a doctor, didn't even mention Matt Reif's name, but he did say like hashtag Netflix comedy and said that feeling when you give your client a new jawline, but then everyone on Netflix is roasting him for it. And Matt Reif actually commented back and was like, giving out medical history is illegal, you know, which to his credit might have been his attempt at trying to play into the joke by being like, hey doc, because it wasn't his actual doctor. But moreover, it's like, mm, it sounds like you're really mad <laughs> about someone making fun of your face when your face should be made fun of. Like if you were a comedian, you could laugh at your own bad cosmetic surgery. I know that when I got Botox above my eyebrows, I looked like straight up Ursula with two legs. I was sucking sea snails out of their shells and singing like a lady with their tits out. But he couldn't take the joke and he never can. He goes off and tells these long winded jokes once again about his mass masturbation habits. Hope I can say that. And the audience isn't like, they're laughing the same amount they always are, but he's built it into his material that it's like, oh, the joke is uncomfortable, so people aren't laughing as much. So he has to pretend like that's the case. You shouldn't be jerking off in the shower anyways, man. <laughs> I'm realizing right now I need more guy fans. If this room was 70% dudes the way it is women, this joke would have been like, ah! Oh, so your reasoning for why this material isn't bringing down the house is because the majority of your fans are women who don't like your humor and just find you attractive, while men don't come to your shows because they don't find you attractive and they don't like your humor. Hmm, it kind of seems like the real issue is that there's no demographic in the population that likes your humor and you like have little to offer other than an appearance that's a couple steps above scream in your face scary. And that's why you're alienating women. You think that men will find your humor more valid. So you go ahead and insult the gender of the people who are actually sitting in the seats. That's genius. It takes a true showman to know that it's best to craft your entertainment for the audience that isn't sitting in the in the audience that night. If only my audience was mostly men, they would love this. Well, your audience isn't mostly men, so clearly they don't love it or they would be there. If men were really drawn to the kind of jokes you tell, they would be buying tickets to the show. Ugly people are comedians often, case in point. The like whole thing about jokes about the difference between men and women is such well-trod territory for comedians that you have to be really innovating with your jokes to like make something new come out of that. And we just don't see it from Matt. God, guys are so gross. <laughs> <sighs> Luckily, we're funny on accident. Mm, no, baby boy, it's clear that you're trying really hard to be funny right now. That's what's contributing to how hard this is for me to watch. Funny on accident, your face is warped on accident. That's the only accident I'm seeing. <laughs> I gotta stop. I'm sorry. I don't think that people are, you know, ugly for having these facial fillers, but the way that Matt goes off about how he doesn't care what anyone thinks, it's like, then why do you do everything in a way that someone who cares what everyone thinks would do? Explain that to me. Especially when he starts talking about social media. He's well known for hating social media. In fact, it just came out that he was like making fun of his old girlfriend, Brooke, who is the co-host of the Cancelled podcast with Tana Mojo. He would like to grade her for using social media as a job when he's only famous for being a TikTok comedian, but he clearly wants to pretend like he's not. Like he has this Joe Rogan working in the nightclub since I was 15 year old act when really, no, you got famous from TikTok for being hot. I'm sorry for you. I think social media is awful. It's such a negative, toxic place. It's awful what people say. These, these, these people, these trolls. Oh, he's doing voices now. Is it bad comedian story time at the library already? I thought that didn't begin until the day I died and went to hell for being gay. I'm just saying it could happen. We don't know what the Bible is talking about is true or not. I could be gay in hell. It'll be a gay day in hell when hell freezes over and we all go ice skating and do figure skating on the ice. <laughs> I'm Woody Woodpeckering my own jokes now. <laughs> <laughs> gay. He tells a story about how he responded to an overweight person on Twitter who was judging him for the way he stowed his bag on a plane. And it's like, girl, nobody's gonna get on your side making fun of the obese that hasn't been considered funny since Shallow Hal starring Jacques Bloch. That's how you say his name in French. Jacques Noir, I guess would be with the actual thing, but names don't work like that. Here's his stupid joke now. You're never gonna hurt my feelings, okay? I've been dead inside for so long. But the thing you have to know about me, I'm a very defensive person. 
Oh, so your defensiveness comes from how much you don't care what anyone says about you. Because that makes sense. Listen, you could never hurt my feelings, but the one thing you need to know about me is that I do take it personally and get very upset when I receive criticism. Like when people say that my jokes aren't sensitive to certain communities, that's just people being too sensitive. And now I'm getting sensitive about that and I have to argue with them in the comment section. Even if they're babies. That's right. Literally, an influencer posted his, her six-year-old son saying, uh, kind of critique about one of his jokes from the beginning when he's making fun of astrology where he says just because Jupiter has a ring and you don't and the kid is like Jupiter doesn't have as many rings as Saturn so that would have been better and you're being mean to girls essentially Matt Reif like someone who truly doesn't care what anyone thinks about him responded to defend himself to this child by saying Jupiter also has ring also has ring oh dot 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 and Santa Kleiss isn't real your mom buys you presents with the money she makes on OnlyFans good luck crazy things. First of all, the mother of this child is a, not an OnlyFans creator. Not that that would be even something to judge somebody for if you respected women. If you can buy your kid presents anyway, any job, that's great. Good for you. As long as you like what you're doing and you're being treated well. And OnlyFans is a great way of doing that for many people. But also this creator, this woman who posted her child has a mostly female audience and doesn't make adult content. So it's like, she made the great point in her response video being like, I have a majority female audience as well. I just don't hate mine. I actually am glad you straight men can stay the f over there and jerk off into your socks like you love to do. And even if she was doing OnlyFans, she's not doing anything wrong. You're just further proving how you're not for the girls. You're not a girl's girl, Matt Rife. Go figure. You're not even a human face. Next, Matt goes on to talk about how, here's a fun fact about me. I actually hate social media. It's like, I don't think you could tell me a fun fact about you if it were written in an obituary. But anyway, go on. For someone who's like so against the snowflakes being too sensitive and making fun of other people is fine. He also has this weird thing about like people People who troll each other on the internet and say something mean about what you posted online are the worst. It's like you can't be anti-bullying and also pro-bullying. Your social media is your art. You can create and share whatever you want to share. If anybody has a problem with that, I say post more of that shit. Do you have any idea how many people don't like me or my comedy? Mm, no, but it'll be fun to guess. Um, three billion? Okay, 2.5 billion, but it also includes your immediate family members. He's just walking right into these insults at this point, isn't he? Really dragging ass at the end. He goes on and makes this long-winded speech about all I've ever wanted to do is make people happy and I'm so righteous and making everyone happy except for all of the people that I've insulted and I made no value for them. Ugh. So I don't know why they say that I only do crowd work when I just did this whole show without any crowd work and I don't do crowd work and you're the crowd work. It's like you're crowd working my last gay f***ing nerve, baby boy. Finish the joke. Nobody believed in me, man. And if I let that affect how I respected my own thoughts and ideas, I wouldn't be doing a Netflix special. But what do I know? I only do crowd work, right? And what do we know? That this was a waste of time and you don't eat ass. Boo! This is the worst thing to ever happen in Baltimore. Take that, the Great Baltimore Fire of 1903. Now, this show is the new impetus for standardizing firefighting equipment in the United States. Bring him with the hose! From now on, the dumb, unfunny men folk get the hose! He thinks eating ass sexually is disgusting. He doesn't wipe his own ass, so that's the real <laughs> secret I'm gonna finish this video on. <laughs> Because that's all we have to say for Matt Reif in his natural selection comedy special today. What did you think of this garbage, which is French for garbage? Let me know in the comments below, but also give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see me break down even more terrible comedy. But I'm going to get back to Christmas content now because that's what makes me truly trumpet and gyoithis. It's not the lyrics. But do let me know in the comments below what you thought. And most importantly, if you're new to my channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. And don't forget, patrons exclusively get to meet me on Patreon tomorrow at 12 noon PST, 3 p.m. Eastern time to chat about Matt Reif and his disgusting ideals. And that'll be something I'm trying to do going forward on new videos. So thank you so much for watching and making sure that we all like to eat ass equally here in this household. You guys are all the greatest. I will see you next time.